So if you type joint hypermobility into the search engine called Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, which is a um, compendium of human genes and genetic disorders, there are over 60 different clinical syndromes which appear. Some of these are multiple congenital anomaly syndromes, some of them are short stature syndromes, and some of them are the hereditary disorders of connective tissue, which are the ones we will address today. Now we think of connective tissue as the sort of the scaffolding of the human body. It includes the bones, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments that hold all of us together. And the molecular components are the collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and mucopolysaccharides that form what's been called in pathology the ground substance. Now, um, the five, and this is arbitrary, I must say, but the most common of the hereditary disorders of connective tissue include Marfan syndrome, Loewy's Dietz syndrome, Stickler syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, and the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and I'm going to address each of these in turn. So Marfan syndrome is characterized by aneurysmal dilation of the ascending aorta, which may lead to dissection and rupture, and without appropriate intervention, may be fatal in, the, uh, in early to mid-adult life. Dislocation of the ocular lenses is another major diagnostic criteria. Patients with Marfan syndrome are usually tall. They often have scoliosis and pectus deformity, arachnodactyly with long, narrow fingers and toes, and dolicostenomelia, meaning a tall, thin body habitus. Lois Dietz syndrome, some people have called Marfan syndrome type two. Uh, Lois and Dietz do not approve of that designation. Um, this is uh, aortic dilation with dissection. The patients often have tortuous blood vessels and there are craniofacial features which may include hypertelorism, malar hypoplasia, and cleft palate or bifid uvula in addition to the joint hypermobility which is very common in this disorder. Uh, just to go back, I did want to mention for Marfan syndrome, virtually all patients have mutations in the gene called fibrillin 1, FBN1. Lois Dietz syndrome, there are now uh, at least four different types that I'm aware of. The most common ones are caused by mutations in the genes transforming growth factor receptor, transforming growth factor beta receptors one and two, so TGFBR1 and TGFBR2. Stickler syndrome uh, is characterized by vitreoretinal degeneration, sensory neural hearing loss, which is usually uh, early in onset, premature osteoarthritis. These patients also may have a cleft palate or bifid uvula and Pierre Robin anomaly with a relatively small chin. Um, and when you look at their x-rays, they present with a spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. So there may be uh, flattening of the vertebrae and um, epiphyseal dysplasia as well. Now osteogenesis imperfecta, or brittle bone disease, has four major types, and two of these types present with average stature, so we cannot preclude it by the um, absence of short stature in the patient. And typically the patients present with frequent fractures. They um, may have really strikingly blue sclerae. Dentinogenesis imperfecta is another feature, so the enamel of the teeth is often um, imper imperfect or uh, thin, very thin, and um, they also present with hearing loss and wormian bones. And finally, we have the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, of which there are many types the three most common of which are the classical, hypermobile, and vascular types. 
And from a clinical perspective, the things we look for in the classical type are the joint type of mobility, find that the skin is extremely stretchy, fragile, and translucent with atrophic scarring and stree. In the hypermobile type, the joint hypermobility is again the hallmark, but the skin involvement is less severe. In the vascular type, we also see the joint hypermobility, and in some of the literature, it suggests that the hypermobility may be most marked at the distal joints of the fingers. In the vascular type, there's aneurysmal dilation and rupture of medium-sized arteries and rupture of the hollow organs. So the vascular type is by far and away uh, the most um, uh, increased mortality of the types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So, When you're thinking, if you have, you're presented with a patient with joint hypermobility um, and thinking about the differential diagnosis, we look at stature and body proportions. Um, we often measure arm span and look at the arm span to height ratio and measure the lower segment and look at the lower segment to upper segment ratio to establish whether the arms are relatively uh, long compared to the height, or the legs are relatively long compared to the height. Um, in Marfan syndrome and in Stickler syndrome, we see relatively long arms <coughs> compared to height, but the mechanism is different, and this is interesting. So, <coughs> excuse me, in Marfan syndrome, we have long bone overgrowth as the mechanism for relatively long arms and legs. In Stickler syndrome, because the trunk is relatively short, because of vertebral flattening, the arms will be long uh, relative to the height. An echocardiogram is a crucial part of the evaluation for patients with joint hypermobility because of the dilation of the aortic, um, of the ascending aorta, which will be seen in um, Marfan syndrome and in Lois Dietz syndrome. And um, Hal Dietz has told me that if we're thinking about Lois Dietz syndrome and the echocardiogram is stone cold normal, you can probably lay that diagnostic uh, consideration to rest. An ophthalmologic evaluation is very important to look for dislocated ocular lenses and also for the vitreoretinal changes that are typical of Stickler syndrome. And an audiology evaluation is important to look for the changes that may be seen, the sensory neural hearing loss uh, that is seen both in Stickler syndrome and in osteogenesis imperfecta. And finally, we must never forget the family history to ask about any patients who've had uh, so, uh, patients' relatives with sudden death, cleft palate, premature osteoarthritis, or frequent fractures. And um, I would just encourage people to have these diagnostic criteria, these diagnostic possibilities on their radar screen. That's the most important thing, to consider that the patient with joint hypermobility may have a hereditary disorder of connective tissue and have a very low threshold for referral to a geneticist uh, for further evaluation. Now, in terms of complications, you're hearing a lot about these um, today, but all of these syndromes may present with musculoskeletal pain, including muscle spasm, myofascial trigger points, um, neuropathic pain from degenerative disc disease, spondyloarthropathy, craniocervical or cervical instability, and nerve impingement at lax joints as well as the neurologic complications about which we're hearing all day today of high cervical myelopathy, Chiari, occult tethered cord, and autonomic dysfunction. So um, again, I think it's important for all of us to kind of get the word out to our colleagues for patients who are presenting with these constellations of symptoms to think about the hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Frankelmann. Are there questions for Dr. Frankelmann?
everybody understands it. 